duty. And then I think we have a last um, presentation on the Haringey deal and moving on to some AOB. So I'm keen that we kind of do get started. Appreciate there will be people kind of joining the meeting in the next few minutes. I know we're always all back to back these days, so that's no problem. And um, if you do join or need to dip out to take a call, etc., just pop a note in the chat. That's absolutely fine. So we know if, if you're still in the call with us. And um, so Aisha, if I could just yeah. ask you um, to just cover off whether we've had any apologies from anyone. Chair, we've just had, as you set out, we've just had apologies from Caroline Haynes, uh, from Councillor Joe, oh, Councillor Joe Gies are joining us, and um, that's all I've had. And we've also, we've also just got one item of urgent business, which is the Haringey deal, which is going to be taken at the end at item 11. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, sorry, I started, um, Councillor Jogi, so apologies. I did explain that um, you, uh, but Caroline's not able to chair today and you were happy for me to chair in her absence. Oh, for sure. Thanks, Verena. Sorry for being a minute late. No problem at all. No problem. So um, if I could just ask that everyone, if you're not presenting, if you remain um, on mute or if you're not asking a question, if you could turn cameras on, though, that would be great. Otherwise, it sometimes does feel for the presenters at least they're presenting to themselves. I appreciate we don't all work in environments where that's possible, so no problem at all if you're if you're not able to do so. And um, but the more the merrier. It always makes me feel like I'm not speaking to an empty screen. So we'll cover off Haringey deal at the end of the meeting. In terms of declarations of interest, and um, does anyone need to declare any declarations of interest before we make a start? No hands up, so I'll take that as a no. The minutes from the last meeting from the 24th of July um, were obviously circulated. Uh, that was on antisocial behaviour, the theme um, for that meeting. Did anyone want to make any comments or any amendments to those circulations? Nope, I will take that as agreed and noted. Thanks so much, Aisha. Um, so membership is noted, that's absolutely fine. Shall we move on to the probation report or Councillor Jogi, would you like me to run through everyone in the meeting? Because actually there's not as many as we normally have. So it's up to you in terms of time, whether or not you think it's useful. I know it's most of us are familiar faces. You're on the chair, Rona. Also, please call me Adam. <laughs> Perfect, no problem at all. Um, I think most of us know each other, so I won't. I'm happy to skip it. But if anyone doesn't know anyone, please do just let us know and I'll happily introduce anyone. That's absolutely fine. Um, I introduced myself at the beginning. Apologies if anyone missed it. If you don't know me, I'm Rona and I'm the Neighbourhood Superintendent for Haringey. So we'll move on to the probation then, um, if Russell is on the line. Um, I'm, afraid, I'm afraid Russell isn't on the line. I think um, I think you guys were, he let you know. Uh, he's unfortunately not able to come to the meeting. My name's uh, Andrew Lodge. I'm one of the senior probation officers at uh, the Lordship Lane office. Um, and he's asked me to do the presentation in his place. So, no uh, problem at all, Andrew. Welcome and thank it's you. It's his presentation, so it might be slightly hesitant because I'm going to have to just go through it. But uh, but if you do have any questions or you don't quite follow, just just ask. No problem at all. Thanks very much, Andrew. Okay, so I'll just um. Uh, so, my understanding is it's a complete overview that you're looking for. So, um, uh, yeah, we, we, we're probation services, so statutory criminal justice service, supervising uh, offenders in the community. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm just actually thinking you've got the you've got the the presentation in your agenda. So, um, I probably I'm probably best off just quickly summarising it and then perhaps responding to any queries. Would that make more sense? I'm just not sure how you guys want to do it, I'm afraid. We have got it contained within the full pack, so yeah. more than happy for you to summarise salient points. And then, Andrew, if anyone has any specific questions on any specific items or anything you say, then uh, then either you can put it up on the screen or Aisha can support you, because I'm sure she has the pack in front of her on the screen. Fantastic. OK, so, yeah. Um, which case I shall smooth over. Um, so yeah, the probation service is it's recently be or last couple of years, it moved from being two services, one looking after uh, the the low or supervising the the lower risk uh, service users, licensees, and people on community sentences, uh, and the uh, other part supervising the high risk. It's re uh, reunified uh, in Harringay. We've now two offices, one one at the Lordship Lane next to the old. Uh, Enfield Magistrates Court and another at La in Lansdowne Road in Northumberland Park. Um, and we manage a mixed caseload of both high risk and um, uh, low and medium risk cases in the community. Uh, we're also part of the IOM uh, setup, 
and I'm the, the IOM lead for that. So probably in a better place to ask answer questions about IOM than than general things. Um, I think as everyone's aware, uh, the remerger of probation has created a number of issues in terms of staffing and, and so forth, but um, uh, those are being sort of ironed down to that and we are just about increasing our staffing numbers. Uh, I think just looking at the, the, they've got the facts and the figures, the reunification in the pack, just to pull out the organisations working at about 60% staffing levels. Uh, which is probably comparable to to other public services at the moment, but I, I'm not sure. Um, we're slightly, slightly below, uh, or sorry, slightly above the the London average in Harringay. Um, we've got slightly better because we have slower staff turnover than a lot of the boroughs and a lot of the staff have been here a very long time. Um, so just just going to go through um, the. Let's go to the key strengths. Key strengths are um, uh, it would be partnership agencies, obviously, in the IOM, we're working with police, third sector agencies, uh, and the local authority housing. Um, from a local point of view, we probably want to do more in terms of our work on the IOM in engaging more agencies than just the police. Um, I'd say I don't know where the scope is for, for, in, for broadening that. But that's just something that's been highlighted as our kind of um, uh, as one of our kind of objectives, both at a London level and locally in Harringay. Um, there we go. Uh, another sort of key strength that's certainly been identified in London is delivery of unpaid work and uh, community service provision. That's really recovered from difficult place of difficult place during COVID when we couldn't run any projects. Uh, so I, I can I can vouch for that as improved dramatically. Um, and uh, from a diversity point of view, extremely diverse uh, staffing group. Um, moving down, that's the that's the that's the identified strengths. Uh, moving down to the recommendations, um, I think it's there's been a, a number of relatively high profile um, uh, cases that have highlighted difficulties we're having in risk assessment and risk management, largely a result of. Uh, or larger results of staffing staffing levels, but also kind of uh, other underly underlying um, organisational problems, which uh, largely stem from this merger of two separate organisations into one. Uh, it's become, it, it has proved very problematic nationally and, and in London. Um, intervention, yes, the record improvement of interventions, these are improving. We've set up a number of partnerships with third sectors agencies, um, and these are constantly reviewing. We're losing some ETE provision, but gaining welfare provision. So it's in constant flux. Uh, but it's uh, it's one of the ones we're looking to improve. Um, the general other recommendations are <laughs> essentially improving our, our levels of oversight and experience, the experience and expertise of our staff. Just speaking in respect of Harringay, we've got a very um, We've got some experienced staff and a lot of very inexperienced staff. There's, a, there's no one really in the middle anymore. Um, so that that's an organisational problem for us. Uh, in the we we have a lot of capacity for people who, who aren't very experienced, a very limited capacity for people who are very experienced, but we do have them there. Um, and that that's unfortunately going to take a while to fix because we, you know we, we have to we build people up rather than bring them in. Um, this is this is where I think Russ will be trying to pitch a um, the partnership because we've got some money now. I, I have absolutely no experience in pitching partnerships or know how to start, so I'm just going to I'm going to read it word for word because you probably make more sense of it than me. So we've got small pot of money, twelve uh, k. So it's a very small pot of money uh, for lo for a local partnership project. Um, I would like to pay for any local service country. Uh, contribute one if any of the partners any thoughts of ideas I think probably that's the most useful thing we can do if people do have something it's just I can then patch that back because um uh we do want to bring people in if we do have some even small amount it might be well worth worth us into uh, worth us having to look so yeah it's got Russell's email but it might be worth just using this time to to uh, speak to me or ask me what what to do 
Um, and then we, I'm so sorry, I wish I'd, I wish I'd had more, more kind of a structure in this, but then we're talking about the IOM stuff. I think probably, shall I pause now? And then if anyone wants to ask about um, anything they said or they've read on the page following me. That's perfect, Andrew. Thank yeah. you, because I think there will definitely be some questions on that part. And then I think it makes it there'll definitely be some questions on the IOM part too. Um, so I can see Matthew and um, go ahead first. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Matthew Knights. I'm the head of service for Youth Justice Service and uh, the Youth Advice Strategy for Having Gay. Um, just, a, just a few questions, really, just to make uh, um, the partnership aware that we do also have, with, with probation, it's a conduct probation officer that sits within the Youth Justice Service that supports with the transition of children going from um, Youth Justice Services into adult probation. That that's really vital role, which is really really critical to support those children um, with that big transition. Because working with Cindy, yeah. justice service and working with adult probation is very very different. So that transitional work is really really critical. So I just wanted to just make the partnership aware that we do have that arrangement with having gay probation, which is great. Um, I know that many local authorities don't have a probation officer um, to do that work, so we're quite lucky to have that. Um, yes. And I guess I guess the second point I just wanted to, to raise. Um, and it was just about um, the IOM, and I know we're going to go into that, but we we do also have a youth IOM, um, which kind of needs relaunching at this moment in time. I had a meeting this morning about it, but maybe I'll hold that question until you finish the next section. Um, and my third question was just about the criteria for the funding. Um, what is the criteria, do you know? If, if you know. I, my understanding, it's a hugely limited understanding, is that it's it's discretionary for us. So I don't think Russ will be able to tell you more, but I wouldn't want to say to back back anything at this stage because it's what I what I read, what I thought is it's discretionary funding for us, so we can use it however we want. But Russell might have all sorts of other rules, but I wouldn't want to say no to anything now because um because I might be kind of backing something back unnecessarily. Okay, because I think it could get linked into the youth IOM. And the support for those children around stop reoffending um, and preventing serious youth violence. So there could be a pathway for that, but we can we can, we can speak about that outside of this. We could. I'm just we're in a bit of a good position because we've recently got a very competent new administrator for our IOM, which we're able to fund uh, a part of a spare time for. So um, I, I definitely, irrespective of of the the, the money, I, I would like to inter to link him with you. To see whether perhaps we can we can have a couple of meetings about the youth IOM and how we can integrate them a bit better because I actually didn't know it existed and I'm the IOM probation to say so, yeah we probably need to meet at some stage. Yeah, I just found out a bit um, about it myself and had a meeting this morning, so yeah, yeah. Okay. there we are. I feel slightly less less bad now if uh, if you only beat me by day. Um, Joe. Oh hi hi Andrew, nice to see you again. Okay, I hope you're yeah. well. Um, yeah, just a couple of questions from me. Um, so the first one was around how how plugged in you are to the local authority, because I'm I'm conscious that you work with a lot of our drug offenders, for example, people that we know are on probation, but also linked into our treatment services in Herringay, potentially into our mental health services. And I'm wondering, um, because a lot of these individuals are the ones that cause us a lot of issues uh, in locally in terms of ASV and other issues mm -hmm. that, that we come across in the borough. And I'm just wondering whether, I'm, may, maybe you can't answer this now, maybe this, this probably needs a further meeting, but how we can um, ensure that you are linked in and plugged into the right resources within the council, because you know the, the the i suppose essentially what we need to start thinking about is how we take a whole system approach to working mm. with offenders and that means that we not pro we're not prioritizing services any in any way but we are collaborating where we can and i think that then starts to uh, impact positively on risk and offender risk which i know you're very concerned about in probation services as are you know our communities and stuff like that so my first one would be around that and, and whether we need to have further discussions uh, about how we make sure that that's happening. Uh, the, the other couple of bits are around strengthening IOM. Uh, that, so I have been involved in some of the Pan London discussions around the commissioning arrangements. So I know a little bit about this um, fund uh, pot of money that Matt's talking about. Uh, and the, the main criteria, Matt, is I think they must be on probation, currently on the probation caseload. So there might be some 
um, issues if it's uh, in terms of funding a youth IOM, but this has come from uh, Enfield who get this funded separately by MOPAC. Um, yeah, so the, so the other thing is around how, how are we going to strengthen IOM and IOM processes and procedures in Haringey? Because I'm slightly conscious that we've lost the thread a little bit over the last couple of years, certainly since yes. reunification. Yes. Um, so I'd like to, you know, I'd love to have a conversation with you guys about how we do that. Um, yeah, and that's it for now. I'm, I'm sure I can think more, but that's well, it for now. If I can, I think definitely how there's two separate things. In terms of, I'll take the, the, the drug services one first. Uh, because we've got, um, we've had an increase in our number of um, probation service officer st uh, staff, which is uh, the non-qualified staff. Mm -hmm. We've able to identify, um, we've able to sort of give people spot roles, which we hadn't been able to do for the last sort of couple of years, to be honest. So we've recently got a, um, uh, a drug services lead, um, a practitioner, so it might be useful if we linked him in, so yeah. that for yourselves, the Grove, and and we can have a, a meeting, um, I'd come to it initially, but then leave it to him as his project, okay. uh, just to kind of coordinate all of that, because um, we we're a bit in the dark, you know, we're a bit kind of bit perhaps a bit too responsive to things coming outside rather than having a clear picture of what's available and, and what we can access. So that's certainly a meeting we need to arrange. Uh, in terms of the IOM, we we're actually um, we've got we we're in the process just seconds before this meeting. In fact, I had to come out of speaking to my administrator for this meeting. Um, we're arranging a meeting with the police to see if we can explore with them opportunities to restructure our our IOM here. So it, it um, we need to have a bigger cohort uh, yeah. on IOM, and we need to be doing more with them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's sort of the bottom line. Yeah. So um, I perhaps I might sort of touch base with the police and, and our administrators to maybe if if you or one of your colleagues would like to come to that meeting. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, and, Andrew, we, sorry, I'm just going to say I definitely think if if that could be joint, that would be really helpful. I think in terms of from a partnership perspective. And then yeah. sorry. If I, I'm conscious of time and I'm conscious Sarah's got a question, I think it's on yes. this bit before we dive too much into IOM, because I think otherwise you could get um, into a discussion on that before you've had a chance to kind of present some of the key summary bits. So, Sarah, if I could bring you in at this point. Hi. So if anyone doesn't know me, I'm public health lead for substance misuse. Uh, we meet with Russell monthly uh, to talk about integrated working. And I think Andrew's kind of said it. It's flux. <laughs> I think that's you know that's that's the issue, but it is that is sounding positive, Andrew, because we have a criminal justice senior lead now as well as a team leader, Andy. Um, the Haringey element of probation now are in two buildings, as you said, um, and I, yeah, I think it's really important. You know, we've got all the training, we're 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 ready to go. So yeah, I think really we really it's, need to take that up and work on it um, and maybe report back to board if we don't make any progress because we've it's been definitely on this true because I, I can remember speaking to we had a we had our one of our meetings and we were saying that there's a little bit of a disconnect between some very good high level communication, but on the ground it's quite confused. So we need to kind of bridge that little gap because it seems that all the support it's there, but it just isn't gelling with us quite yet. So um, hopefully we can we can all get that sorted out. Perfect. Thank you, Andrew. I don't know if you want to kind of cover off the second bit of your presentation in terms of IOM kind of summary. Feel free not to necessarily go through all of it if you don't want to. We, yeah, we all no, have I'll, the clock, I'll, and I'm I'll sure we'll have some good bits. I'll go through it, but please jump in because otherwise I'm just reading stuff you can read. You see what I mean? So just jump in if you need anything. So um, we've got 61 uh, IOM nominals. On the on our caseload at the moment, that's I say that's probably lower than we would want. Of those, the thirty red nominals, which are the ones we're most concerned about. Um, so those are the those are people who are um, actively say actively working uh, with the police or with us, uh, or we're actively working them to try and reduce uh, or prevent uh, further reoffending. So. And, uh, and we, we'd probably consider them at the highest risk of committing further offences. We've then got eight ambers, which are the ones going in the right direction. 
uh, in the sense that they are going to be working with us well, and we're not we 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 are reassured, I should say, that they're moving away from criminal activity. And then the green ones are the ones that uh, we've got seven of those, uh, which are the ones we're considering exiting the scheme because they've got a number of but we've managed to establish a number of protective factors. We've got a new category called blue IOMs, um, which is which is very new, which are ones in prison. It's not it's not that complicated. So it's it's we 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 there was um off there was a recent uh, serious further offence review uh, where there was uh, an IOM nominal who was delisted from the scheme because they went into custody. And uh, so when they came out again, um, the, the support had to be almost like reconstituted, but unfortunately uh, he had seriously offended before any of that could be done. So as a response, they've uh, changed the structure of IOM slightly so that we'd include people who are in custody on the IOM cohort to just add a little bit more of a kind of bridge from um, uh, from custody to the community. So um, just going through very quickly, predominantly male, um, and then effectively ethnically, it would be the same as the, the pretty much the same as, as Harangay, generally speaking. Um, the interest in the drug, uh, about 50% in drug dependent. Now that historically is much, much lower than IOM has in the past. So if anyone's got experience working at IOM, used to be almost synonymous with regular drug users because they've changed the entry criteria to be uh, effectively more risky people. People are more concerned with violent offending. The proportion of um, IOMs with Significant drop problems gone down. That's that's why that might be a bit of a surprise to you guys. Um, and then say just over half uh, of the those who have drug problems are in drug treatment. The, that probably I would say just working kind of on the field. That's probably a slightly misleading figure because I would say that of that sixty nine percent in drug treatment you would create that it would be a much smaller percentage that we would feel the drug treatment is being effective and that they're engaging fully those ones that are registered with the group if that makes sense um, and that's something probably we'd have to work on um when we're looking at kind of integrating the drugs and substance misuse services a little bit better with probation is how we can get that 69 people percent of people who are engaged with the grave actually engaging with them rather than just registered with Okay, let's go down a little bit. So uh, this is a break. It's a breakdown by ward. I, I I don't know if that I can really take much from that, but that's your breakdown by ward. Um, and then uh, the the numbers down for arrest. I don't know if anyone's sorry, uh, Rona. That's all right, Andrew. So that did interest me, actually. And I um, I wasn't going to pull chairs prerogative and get the first hand up at the beginning bit when you talked about money, because I'm sure that yeah. all joined, uh, kind of caught our attention when we read the papers in advance. So this drew my attention because of Haringey and Northumberland Park wards and then the NFAs kind of obviously kind of in between. Um, but it drew my attention because of the kind of two clear hole build pilot sites that we are launching on the borough, oh. one in Harringay Ward, one in Northumberland Park mm -hmm. Ward. And I, I think there's a real need in terms of kind of the joint up that we were speaking about there before, but maybe also a real opportunity in terms of targeted stuff. So absolutely agree with Matthew in terms of the opportunities there around targeting that funding, potentially at some kind of youth provision. Um, but also, I think in, in terms of specific geographical areas, whether that's something that we could consider looking at. I, and I know, Sarah, from previous conversations, we've spoken about kind of the, um, the drugs focus in terms of Northumberland Park in particular, but I know also that's a real issue in terms of Haringey Ward. I think that would be potentially a real value. And if other partners felt that would be too as an approach to actually go alongside Clearhole Build and look at using that funding, I'd be really happy to take that offline with Russell amongst others on the call. But I just thought I'd throw it out there because I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I, I mean, as you, as you can see, I just like, well, this is just some numbers on a bit of paper. Uh, and it, it did strike me when you were saying, just from a probation point of view, the kind of the location of of service use and distribution of service users within the borough isn't something that we we really you know I'm being very honest here yeah. it's not something we speak about so so I'm just I, I don't know if it's something that a bit part bit of a pie in the sky but it might be useful if somebody is well aware of 
of what different parts of Harringay mean in that sense. If if that if they could speak to us as a team, that would be wonderful because, as I say, not only a small proportion of staff work in Harringay, even yeah. of those uh, live in Harringay, sorry, even of those, um, they're not necessarily going to under you know the demographics so this could be a really if someone does have time to come and speak to us as a as an office or a pair of offices that might be really really useful uh, for sure we can, see, we can see addresses and postcodes so oh, we know that that person's yeah. living in this kind of area or whatever yeah i think joe brian sandeep uh, and kind of myself i think there's, there's loads that we could kind of probably add to that and add mm. some real value even in the longer term sandeep if i can just bring you in yeah, no, thank you, Andy. Re really interesting. And yeah, certainly on that last point, I'd be happy to kind of to come by. In in the past, I have kind of presented to probation on you know the Harringay uh, overview, the perspective of kind of what's happening, different areas, hotspots, what we're seeing emerging, risks, that kind of stuff. So happy to link in with you on that. Yeah, that, um, it, that, that'd be really yeah, it'd be useful. It'd be certainly yeah. useful for the staff because like I said, we've got a lot of new staff, so they wouldn't have heard yeah. the presentation before. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, with regards to this data, I mean, it's, it's really good to see um, data for, from probation, um, you know, on this kind of stuff. I mean, we, we used to get it historically, as I'm sure you'll know, um, stuff around crim criminogenic needs and all that kind of stuff. So it's brilliant to see this, um, particularly fascinating around the breakdown of the drug use, you know, the kind of quite, quite stark, you know, 48% being drug dependent, which I think is quite interesting. Um, yeah, some really interesting data here. Maybe we can, you know, uh, kind mm -hmm. of speak outside the meeting, not only on that first part about perhaps be presenting to you guys, but also how we can maybe kind of maintain some data flow um kind of the core of what i do is run analytics so perhaps using some of your data would really enrich the kind of stuff that we yeah, that we yeah have we locally. we've got quite a lot of data people at the moment in probation so Brilliant. um <laughs> i don't know i don't know i don't know how they'd respond to, to, to requests particularly but definitely we will see what we can do thank you yeah sounds good thanks sandeep um and brian if i could bring you in yeah just um i just really interesting to hear some of the things say it'll be i think it'll be useful for because i don't know if anybody from your service is a member of our of the ppsg um and i think it'll be really useful for somebody from your service to be core member um sandy presents some really really useful data each month which helps us plan and prioritize and focus um what we're doing and i think how you your data and how your service area weaves into that I think is really important because the issues that are coming up predominantly around what we're talking about and I think there's definitely a missing link here um, so I'll be really keen to to sit down with you and understand a bit more the data where you guys are, are working and who you're working with and how we can weave that in into a regular um, uh, sort of package so that we've got oversight of your area as well um, and I said that um, Sandy provides some really really good information I just think if if we've got some information from you as well we will we'll be in, in in a stronger place to sort of um, focus our resources and 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 um, make some improvements definitely a try. I mean I'm not sure so I might be writing checks I can't cash but um, uh, I can I can definitely see if I can link in with the people without without like our data link from the centre and see what you know how we can package stuff that's useful to you and things definitely. like that. Definitely, um, well, there must be a way. Yeah. I, 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 there's got to be a way because um, it's all linked. So, yeah. you know, I think we need to have a conversation outside this meeting to see how yeah, that definitely. what how definitely. that what that looks like. So that <clears throat> excuse me, when it's brought, you know, it's it's brought in a way that it it, it completely links in. And it's informative, but it all can also be tweaked based on you know the narrative of the, of of any specific topic in the meeting so let's let's maybe catch up i don't know if it's yourself or one of your colleagues if we maybe myself yourself sandeep and maybe joe can catch up outside of the meeting bottom this out mm. that'd be really good that sounds like a good action from the meeting thank you this is definitely proving useful already um, and thanks brian um see now just bring you in and then we'll i think we'll move on to the rest um andrew if you don't mind just to summarize yeah. towards the end if that's okay Zina. thanks ryan and now i just wanted a clarification i'm not sure i've i've got the gr i've got a grip here um in talking about integrated offender management this isn't your entire herringay probation caseload is it no, no that's, that's this just is um, the, just for those of us who are lay people. I might have missed a bit of it because I was a few minutes late into the meeting. Um, looking at the numbers, I think, well, that's a bit low on probation <laughs> for the borough. No, <laughs> Could you just clarify? Very Could you clarify probation. what that means? 
So the the IOM is a, is a separate cohort which have joint police and probation involvement. Oh. So uh, the, the selection criteria is based on um, uh, the sort of statistical data. So how um, how risky they are and how prolific they are. So these would be the um, uh, the the more prolific offenders, more prolific, dangerous or not dangerous, but um, uh, risky offenders uh, within the uh, within Harringay. Now the, the the total the total case value, I think, just is around nine hundred. So so of that nine hundred, we've got sixty sixty one. I think it was on the IOM scheme. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Zina. Um, Andrew, was there anything else from the, the pack that you wanted to pull out? I know at the, the end in particular, there was mentioned kind of about mental health, and user engagement and neurodiversity and community mentoring services or anything else that you wanted to pull out? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the new service. We haven't seen it yet, if that makes sense. So this is what this is. Um, that's it. it's news to me as well, but I did have a hint of it. Um, so, so they are bringing back, they used to a few years ago have um, mental health provision with the IOM, they're bringing it back, uh, that, that's the structure. Uh, we have to wait and see how it works, to be honest. I don't really want to say anything because it hasn't started yet. Sure, perfect. Was there anything else that you wanted to highlight? Uh, no, no, I think, I think certainly nothing else I've been told to highlight. I think, I think that's it, I think that's it. Thank you. And there was just one thing for me, which um, I guess just is a, a bit of a question, really, in terms of my understanding. So the 69 percent, I think it was, who are in drug treatment. And I appreciate you said that not all of the 69 percent might necessarily be actively engaging in that treatment. But so the 31 percent who aren't, they are drug dependent, but aren't engaging in that treatment. Is that correct? Mm, yeah, I, I, I th it's a bit of a misleading table, but I think it can only be that because uh, because the numbers don't add up otherwise. Yeah. So that, was, that would be people who are down as drug dependent, but not not engaging with the group. Okay. So there'll be people I was trying to, 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 I was trying to figure that one out because that just seems yeah. like a huge opportunity for us really there, to be honest with you. Um, and I think kind of probably goes back to what Sarah was saying earlier. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Matthew, I'll bring you in. Yeah, sorry. So, um, so just reflecting on the conversations um, today, um, I'm just really conscious of that vulnerable cohort of children that are being transitioned from um, um, youth justice services um, over to probation. And just thinking about the youth IOM that is now hopefully going to be relaunching. I guess we need that transition also for the youth from the youth IOM over to IOM when they turn 18, because essentially they could just fall through the net and slip off the radar of services. So I'm really conscious of joining up the dots and making sure that that happens so we can definitely me outside to discuss that and I guess the other offer Andrew is about how we um, do a briefing to your staff within within probation about what youth justice service does and that tra and, the, and the importance yeah. of that transition because they're very two different ways of working and actually in order to get the best outcome and to prevent reoffending, we need to work with that cohort really really differently in, in comparison to a 35 year old person in probation so, so i just so think do, yeah yeah so i think there is something about how we also do that and have a conversation about about the kind of working practices and and um and and what we can do it's uh, get it will get lucinda involved as well so that, that's our transition yes. officer uh perhaps we're kind of trying to reboot all our spot roles so that fit very nicely into what we're trying to do um within probation as well uh but yeah no, that's that's good Perfect. Thank you. I think if there's no other questions, we will just thank you. And there's lots to take up outside, um, Andrew. So loads of opportunity in there, which is absolutely brilliant. No doubt we will absolutely take you up on the funding offer. The data sharing is really important. I can definitely see how, how that would add to the partnerships work. And um, I think, Brian, you made a really good point about PPSG in terms of quite a, a tactical level at a local neighbourhood level. Andrew, what opportunities we could have there. I also think, Joe, there's a link to North Area Violence Reduction Group um, on a broader level. And I know obviously Sandeep kind of is, is the main um, and kind of provider into that in terms of data and I think that could really add some value so thank you and Andrew um, if you don't mind just popping your email and chat because I know once it goes out not necessarily everyone has access to your contact information if you wouldn't mind I know Russ is in the pack and if anyone has any questions or needs to arrange anything outside we can use that there. No worries so brilliant. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Perfect.
OK, Andrew, I think we, and Matthew, I think you have not one but two presentations for us coming up next. Is that right? Just one? No, it's, it's one, it's one. <laughs> um, <laughs> so basically what we provided was two different things. One was the Youth Justice Annual Plan, yeah. just for the partnership to understand um, um, how we performed against the previous plan and what our plan is for this year in terms of um, our strategic objectives. The presentation basically summarises the full report because the full report is quite lengthy. I'm not going to take all your time up today on regards to that. So I think it was a good opportunity for me today was to outline and highlight the, the key bits from the strategic annual plan and what the partnership board have signed off. So this partnership is aware. Um, and then also talk to you a little bit about the kind of relaunch of the youth at risk strategy. So um, it's in that one presentation. Perfect. So is there somebody that could help bring it up or I can bring it up on my screen? I show. Aisha, would you mind doing that for Matthew, just so that he's able to kind of keep his own screen? It's always difficult if you're presenting and can't see. Thank you. Bear with us, Matthew. We'll sort that for you. I'm happy to do it if that's easier, because I've got it open, if that helps. Oh, sorry, Aisha, you're on mute. Yeah, I'm just bringing it. I've got the PDF version, so it's just taking a while. I won't be a minute, then I'll bring it up. No <coughs> so whilst that's coming up, I'll just to kind of explain a little bit more about um, the Youth Justice Service Annual Plan. Um, so the annual plan has been agreed by the Youth Justice Service Partnership Board um, and it's signed off and we have to submit it to the Youth Justice Board. The Youth Justice Board have oversight over all of the Youth Justice Services across England and Wales and we have to submit this as part of our um, um, key objectives and to ensure that we also get our funding from the Youth Justice Board. So essentially, just whilst that's being loaded, um, the Youth Justice Annual Plan basically gives an overview of the work um, of the Youth Justice Service and the wider partnership. And it's important to recognise that it's not just the work of the Youth Justice Service, it's actually the wider partnership, which is really, really critical. Oh, no, sorry, that's the um, actual annual plan itself. I've got the presentation which summarises this. I'll bring it up on my screen, that will make it easier. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks anyway, Aisha. Apologies, Thank I don't you. think it's in this, actually. Thanks, Matthew. Okay, can everybody see that? Yeah, you're good. Okay, perfect. Um, I can't see everybody on the screen, so um, somebody will just have to let me know if anybody's got their hand up. But I will pause I will do, no problems. So as I was saying, um, the Youth Justice Service Annual Plan basically is the overview work of the Youth Justice Service within Haringey and the wider partnership. And I just wanted to really emphasise about the wider partnership because the partnership board has statutory board members that have to be on there. And we have to think about the wider partnership in ensuring that we meet our key objectives. Um, and what the annual plan does is to really focus on how we performed last year and outline our priorities for the, for the year ahead. And that's what the partnership plan um, um, goes into more detail about. But also it's about a celebration of our achievements um, as a service and the examination of the work we aim to achieve to continue our development and, and improvement going forward. So just a quick summary about why we do the plan. The strategic objectives go into 14 different objectives that the boards um, focused on. So I'll quickly run through these without going into too much detail, but we will be continuing our commitment to a child first approach. So we have really tried to change the narrative around how we see children and actually having that child first approach and offender second approach is really, really critical in, in our work. Um, we want to really increase and strengthen the participation and the voices of the children in their families. So there is a lot of work happening around how we capture that and, and, and doing things a bit differently in order um, around how they influence our changes in policies, procedures and also around how we work with them as well. Um, we're focusing on our constructive resettlement, so really focusing on that um, focus on those children being resettled from custody back into the community and how and how that links into children's social care and also health. So really triangulating that work, um, increase the number of victims um, engaged and promote the value of restorative processes to improve the health offer and health outcomes for children 
to offer the issue um, and and say to address the issues of stop and search and the impact in terms of disproportionality and racial disparity, um, to increase the focus of disproportionality within the context of remands and in custody, because we have quite a high number of children that are remanded and sentenced. The wider partnership will consider disproportionality in general, um, to work with our partners to increase out of court disposals work. So these are our children around prevention and diversion. Um, and just to, so I'm not going through every single one, but essentially um, what we also want to improve is around our education, health and well-being outcomes for those children, especially those children that are in care, CP, and also have a special education needs and disability. So loads of objectives that the board have set us for this year, and we have a partnership plan that sits underneath this to measure the impact of our work against all of these strategic objectives. So it's very wide reaching, as you can see. So just to kind of give um, uh, this partnership a bit of awareness about the Youth Justice Service and the kind of work that we do, because some of you might know a bit more than others around what we do, but just as a high level kind of approach here, we work with children um, around our prevention and diversion. That's primarily around our out of court work. So those children who don't go to, you know, don't get charged um, in terms of a serious offence or meet the threshold for going to court. So we work with those pre-court children and also around our new turnaround programme, which is focused on diversion. So we got this new turnaround programme funding, which is focused on those children that are released under investigation, that are on bail, or also those children that have potentially been on bail for a long period of time, but then have potentially been acquitted at, at trial. What usually happens, those children kind of just um, all the services that was around those children then kind of get dropped sometimes. So we have this turnaround program that hopefully um, doesn't allow for those children to fall through the gap. So if there are needs or identified needs for the child and the family, we can continue to support with them. Whereas historically, youth justice service wouldn't because they don't have a conviction. So that's just a little bit about our prevention diversion work. We also focus on our, um, our post-court work, so those children on conditional bail and also sent um, community sentences. Um, we also work with the children in custody, in, in prison essentially, who are remanded and sentenced. So we, we work with the child all the way through um, and we will work with that child on remand and sentence and then back into the community on license. And then our kind of fourth element is around transition. I kind of spoke a little bit about that already today. Just to give you some of the key highlights from um, last year, which is within the strategic plan, our caseloads um, has reduced in recent years, but increased in the last year from 73 to 86 um, children with, um, throughout the year. The caseload is disproportionately male, um, which was 88% um, um, in 2020 to, two, to, to 23 compared to 91% the following year. So there's been a slight um, decrease in that um, in terms of our disproportionate um, number of, 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 of male children. Secondly, our black children are overrepresented. So there was 50% of our, of our cohort um, is um, black or overrepresented in comparison to 52 the previous year. The risk and safety and well-being is increasing. So this is um, through our assessment process. We've done some analysis and 45% are higher risk in compared to 36 the year before. What that's showing us, even though the cohort is remaining quite stable or is increasing, the complexity and risk factors in, in, relation, in, in relation to those children remain really high for the having gate children cohort. Those identified with mental health needs is currently at 62% which is um, predominantly similar to the previous year. And really violence, drugs and robbery offences represent 71% of our caseload. So when you couple that by um, the disproportionality and you couple, and, and you couple that by um, our um, number of children in terms of assessments, you can see why now that the complexity of the offences coming in are much more higher um, in terms of the gravity of offences um, in comparison to previous years. And lastly, around our children in care. So 
um, as a snapshot, within um, in March, we had 16 children in care, one on child protection plan and eight on a SIN plan. So I'm not going to go through this in too much detail, but just, just to let you kind of have a bit of an idea around our key performance indicators. We have the five indicators on the left hand side, which focuses on um, our national indicators that we have to report back to the Youth Justice Board on. Also around our education, uh, management oversight of audits, our case management and children in care. So we report on all of these kind of performance indicators and um, report it back to our Youth Justice Board um, partnership board, but then also to other relevant um, um, boards within uh, children's social care um, and across early help as well. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you can see it within the slides in terms of what the output is and what the target is, and the management board um, has oversight over this uh, key performance indicators. So that's before I move on to the next part, that's a quick whistle stop of the plan. Um, and what we're doing for this year um, in terms of how we're working with the cohort uh, is just to give you more of a high level um, understanding around um, the youth justice service. So before I move on, I'll pause to see if there's any questions. No hands up so far, Matthew. No, OK, that's okay. fine. I will, I will move. Oh, Councillor Bamazon. Oh, I can't see a hand up from Zena. Apologies. Oh, I saw one. It went back down. No, oh, maybe not. Maybe not. OK. Zena, did you want to come in? My hand wasn't up. No, I didn't put my oh, hand up. There oh, we go. False Sorry. alarm. Sorry, false alarm. <laughs> no worries. Matthew, I think all very clear then. No problem. If you want to go on to the second part, thank you. OK, great. So just to really talk to you about some of the, the, the wider partnership stuff. Um, hold on. Sorry, the slides not working. Yeah, it's working out. So really just to talk to you about the youth at risk strategy. So this also sits on my portfolio now. So many of you are aware that we have um, the youth at risk strategy, which is a 10 year strategy uh, that the council um, have employed. The first action plan ran from 2019 to 2023. Um, and there was some um, evaluation done on that work to understand what that was um, how that was working in practice, what did that look like from a strategic perspective and what were some of the learning. Um, but overall responsibility of this strategy has now moved from um, community safeties um, and also into um, early help and prevention and SEND now. So it now sits within children's services as such before it was sitting um, in community safety. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, because this is the first time I've come to this uh, community safety uh, partnership board, is just that you would have been aware of that in terms of um, that being discussed previously. We were. Thank you, Matthew. Perfect, perfect. So really just to kind of speak to you about what's happened since and what we've been doing in the background. So, so we've now got a new action plan, uh, which has been um, developed with the partnership. Um, and it's focusing on a few things. So it, it focuses on the review of the progress and, and impact of successes. It has a new action plan which aligns with our priorities for actions across five outcome areas. So it's been a bit more streamlined in terms of five outcome areas. <coughs> and we have our partnership um, really focusing on uh, that approach and how they are and, and, and how they're going to support those priorities. There was a new impact framework that all the partnership that have, that have been um, uh, now working towards uh, the strategy and now all being um, contributed under the same impact framework. So new measures have um, been implemented to really think about how we learn and improve. There is also a difference governance and partnership arrangements. So there's a, there's a new focus on partnership working with the voluntary sector um, and children, young people's at the heart of what we're trying to do in terms of moving forward with it. In terms of the next step, we're just um, in the final stages of finalising partners' inputs into the action plan, which has now been done. We're just awaiting sign off, um, and and then and then that will be shared across the partnerships in terms of the new action plan. Um, we have established a participation network with a new terms of reference. So this is around aligning 
the voluntary sector alongside um, statutory services as well, bringing them together and really thinking about how we collectively um, coordinate approaches around serious youth violence across um, Haringey. What we're hoping to do within the new year is hold a summit to promote the new action plan and build relationships within the partnership and have children and young people as part of that summit as well. Um, so, we'll, you know, we'll go into much more detail about what the action plan is and what we're planning to do and how um, we're trying to bridge the gap between statutory services and obviously the, the voluntary services as well underneath this new action plan. And eventually, at some point in the autumn next year, we will have an annual impact report where all of the partners who um, are embedded in that um, action plan <coughs> provide their data and everything else and we will have an impact um, report and we'll develop a simple guide and share our approach so officers and partners have a clarity um, and an adequate, um, adequate time to respond to that um, annual report as well. And the annual report will be a yearly annual report that we will be doing to really measure the impacts um, that having gay um, services are having. And yeah, that's it as a summary. Thanks so much, Matthew. Um, I can't see any hands up, so I'll jump in with a question and give people a second to, to think about something. Or well, less of a question, probably, and more of a point. So um, you'll have to excuse me, colleagues on the line. I've literally just returned from a month off work, which I've never said in my life. Um, so I, I won't moan about my email inbox, but apologies if I have missed um, some date updates, Joe. Uh, I'm not sure when MOPAC have confirmed for them to be holding their um, Children Police Custody public event on the borough. I know there was some date to move, so apologies, I have to catch up with Joe afterwards to double check, because I'm not up to speed with latest, I'm so sorry. But it just occurred to me, Matthew, that that might be, and sorry if it's already been discussed, as an opportunity to reference stuff like the summit, to reference the action plan, and I guess just to, I, a, get some publicity around it, B, welcome some views on it, because I know they're really keen to get a wide range of um, local residents, local young people, but also partners from across London in the room. And they've they've offered up an opportunity for us to kind of put stuff into a workshop and, and they can kind of help and suggest stuff. So if that is of any interest whatsoever, even if it's just to say we might have a summit coming up in January or in the new year, I just thought I'd throw it out there as an idea. But again, apologies, I'm not up to date in terms of whether that or not that's already been discussed. And that was it from me. Um, anyone else want to come in to Matthew? Beth, thank you. Rona, I just wanted to say that it's it's really encouraging to see this really this important piece of work coordinated in this way under the Youth Justice Service. Um, I think that we've had long conversations over the three three and a half years, certainly in my time, around we know that there's great work going on in quarters of the borough, but we've never had that balcony view um, so that we can really start to think about targeting and under better in terms of analysis, understanding what needs to be commissioned in the in, in particular quarters so really well done to matt and the team for pulling this together and bringing it here today uh, i think it is about socializing it um, and ensuring for matt what do you need from the partners um i think at this moment there isn't any need for the partners i think firstly it was about making you aware about where we were going and what we was doing I think mm. there's been quite a lot of engagement with colleagues um, already um, from this partnership um, that have to have contributed. So Sandeep and Joe and some others. So you've got uh, public health who have been involved and Council of Amazon has, has, has had the briefing. So many people have been involved and there isn't any identified gaps. I think for us at the moment, we've now got all of the feedback that we need from partners um, and we have now done the action plan. It's now moving on with the next part. So I guess what I would need is once we confirm the summit um, and everything else, we will reach out to this partnership as well to make everybody aware, um, to distribute amongst your teams, um, for you to attend, that would be great, um, to get a bit more of an insight. Um, and then obviously feeding back in um, around your observations from um, the, the impact report once we do it, we'll, we'll bring it back here and kind of get your views as well in terms of the impact report. So it's just about the continued engagement really and making sure that you guys are aware around um, the progress and anything else you might think that would be helpful. 
Thanks, Matthew. And thanks, Bev, a great question. And I suppose one thing I can offer up from, from my end in terms of the policing um, partner in the room is we're kind of discussing at the moment and have been for some time solidifying some public pledges and um, so I know um, Caroline as the BCU commander with myself has been in conversation with Pera as the leader and um, also Andy as the chief exec around actually publicly committing okay we have the new Met for London commitments the commissioner has made across London but locally what are we doing off the back of a the new Met for London plan but mostly the Baroness Casey report what you just described in terms of the new action plan goes to the heart of a lot of those issues and I definitely would be really keen to be much more explicit about not just committing to some of the things we're going to talk about committing to will be covered and it kind of linked to your action plan and cover off things but actually being really explicit about that maybe where some of the governance sits for our pledges sits within kind of your action plan so mm. we can have that conversation offline but I think there's a real opportunity there and just thanks to Bev for kind of nudging my brain in that direction and um, so thanks Matt we could take it offline. Um, Zena. Um, yeah I've gone through this report a few times and it's going to go to full council it has to be agreed by the youth justice plan has to be agreed by full council um, as part of the statutory process but we are preparing for an Ofsted inspection, are we not, Matthew, at some point in the near future? And yeah. that really, that, that issue about the collaboration with partners is really important. I think, I think it would be remiss not to remind people that this work, the Youth Justice Service doesn't stand alone. Mm -hmm. It has to be a partnership. There has to be engagement. People have to turn up at the meetings. All these things, because we we haven't been inspected for quite a while. And when we are inspected, we need it to to really be have a good outcome, obviously. Not just that we, we get the outcome for being good, but it is a good service. So what you were saying, Rona, is really important. And I think for other people here to engage in that, it's a small cohort of people, but it's hugely staff intensive. And, you know, it's, it's hugely challenging the work with the young people and the preventative stuff we don't want people into the system so there's all stuff around it but just to say we are expecting Ofsted when Matthew? Anytime now um, we're preparing right. now um, and, and, and it's a good point Zina um, Ramazan so it's just to make everybody aware that there will be an ask for some key colleagues to be part of um, a network meeting once the inspectors do come um, but we'll do some prep work with everybody once, once once we know that. But we've already got the list of who we would want to call. So you guys will be um, getting a notification soon in the next few weeks to say you will be part of this group once the inspectors come. And this is what we would um, want us, you know, this is what, how we can prepare for it collectively as well. So thank you, um, Council of Amazon, for bringing that to my attention. I, I, I forgot about that, even though that's part of my day-to-day -day work that I've been preparing for. Thank you so much both. Brian. Yeah, just really quickly, I just, uh, just want to um, offer out an invite for you to attend our next PPSG. I just think some of the information in, in your presentation would be really wel welcomed uh, amongst the, um, the core group. And again, I'd invite uh, yourself or one of your team to attend the meeting and sit on the the group if they have time but if I, if we could maybe reach out after the meeting and I'll send you off to an invite just five minutes just to give an overview of the action plan and again how it weaves into the to the wider uh, piece of work that PPSG do monthly. Yeah no problem. Thanks Brian and I, I think Bev might have just up oh you, there you are sorry Bev you disappeared for a second it's the background yeah. I think sometimes sorry, they come in and out don't they? <laughs> The Wi-Fi is a bit bad where I am. Can you hear me all right, Rona? Yes, we can. Thank you. I mean, Matthew, there's going to there's a this this coordinated approach is just what I think is going to be helpful for position us in a place of strength when and if we get the JTI on serious youth violence call, and everybody that's involved in anything to do with serious youth violence will be called on to contribute to what we have. Um, what we understand and what we have done about some of the um, uh, the notions of serious youth violence in Haringey. So this policy, this 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 um, the coordination work that Youth Justice is doing should also hold sight of the fact that a JTI is due in Haringey on serious youth violence.
I don't know if I broke up. Did no, you hear me, we've Rona? We've got you there. Matthew but is nodding. Have I, have I paralysed people by a JPI no, inspection? No, you haven't. Don't worry. <laughs> but I think, Beverly, it's, it's, it's a very, very important point. And um, I guess it's just about how, as a local authority, we're now going to be preparing for that as a partnership. Absolutely. And, and what we're going to be doing moving forward. I think parts of the work we're doing, yes, falls, falls nicely in terms of... Um, what you know what are some of the work happening in in regards to serious youth violence but there's also a little bit around preparing for the j tire which is a bit different and how you know what the expectation is of everybody and what that entails um and also trying to get some learning from some of the current local authorities that are going through that right now i think manchester have just gone through theirs so it's just about getting some of that learning and then bringing it back to this partnership is around this is you know this is what some of the learning that's come out from Manchester and X Y and Z and what is it that we need to do as a partnership to also think about and prepare for. So uh, Rona, I'll take that um, that challenge as an action for me to bring back some of the learning from other local authorities and I know that our DCS is likely to be the person who will lead the JTI board preparation board. Perfect. Thank you, Bev. But this work is going to be critical to our evidence base. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm really happy also, I guess, just to go back to the point I made earlier, to also socialise internally within the police and um, the kind of contents of that new action plan, I think, post the public meeting, the MOPAC public meeting um, on children in custody, I was planning on doing a bit of an inter internal blog to just send out to our kind of officers and staff working on Haringey and Enfield, just to say, basically, this was the public meeting, this is what it was about. Um, and I can put within there um, a brief bit of information on that just to socialise some of the key points, Matthew. Um, uh, the more we can drip feed internally within the Met too, I think would be helpful. Um, any other questions for Matthew? No. Matthew, anything else to add? No, thank you for having me. Thank you. Perfect. No problem at all. So I have just managed to move my paper. I think it was on the serious violence duty. Is that right? I've just managed to move the second piece of paper I had. So I'm so sorry. I think that was next on the agenda. Is that right, Aisha? Yeah, it's the um, serious violence duty. So I think Stan, is Stan Deep. Perfect. Yeah. Hi, Sandeep. Thank you. Sorry, I lost my paper. I've got your presentation, just not the agenda. I've somehow moved it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, I'm just sharing my screen at the moment. Just tell me, please, when that um, yeah. can be seen. We've got it, Sandeep. Great, thank you very much. Um, so this is just really um, an update on the serious violence duty, which I know is something we've brought to this um, community safety partnership and different boards um, over the last kind of six or so months, I suppose. Um, really an update on serious violence duty, where we are currently, um, kind of uh, what we have left to do essentially to meet the duty, and also some key findings that have so far been um, generated from the needs assessment. So really just um, just to recap, I suppose, the serious violence duty, um, that was a new duty introduced by the government um, at the start of the year in January 2023. Um, it's a national duty, England and Wales, um, every community partnership across the whole of England and Wales is required to um, fulfil the requirements of the serious violence duty. In particular, um, at, at its first stage of where we are now, essentially, there are uh, two real main uh, requirements for us to, to fulfil uh, and that needs to be uh, in place by the 31st of January 2024 and essentially they are uh, to number one produce an evidence-based analysis of uh, serious violence in our community safety partnership area so Haringey for us and then also bring that into a strategic overview of our approach to serious violence uh, in Haringey um, and as I mentioned those need to be published on our website on the Haringey uh, Council website by the 31st of January 2024. Um, so the responsible authorities uh, who are essentially responsible for ensuring that we fulfil the duties of the serious violence um, requirements and legislation uh, known as the duty holders uh, essentially are those who are some of the core members of community safety partnership. So the police quite clearly, fire and rescue authorities, youth offending probation, uh, health and also local authorities. Um, but beyond the, the essential duty holders, there are a number of other uh, uh, authorities, organisations, particularly education and some of the other organisations uh, wider across the partnership who clearly also have a big role to play in ensuring that we uh, successfully meet not only the requirements but also uh, ensuring that we're doing all we can to, to look to reduce serious violence across the whole borough. 
So with regards to serious violence, clearly that can mean lots of different things. Um, for London, the London Violence Reduction Unit has actually defined serious violence, serious violence for the purpose of the duty as uh, what's shown on screen here. That looks rather technical, but essentially um, it can be summarised by essentially looking at most types of violence that affect young people aged under 25. Um, secondly, domestic abuse. And thirdly, sexual violence. So those are the main essentially categories of violence that uh, are being encompassed within serious violence, the serious violence duty. So things like homicide, GBH, um, ABH type offences, as well as sexual offences such as rape or sexual assaults, and then things like personal robbery, threats to kill, and other violence also generally fall within the serious violence definition. Now, it's not to say clearly that we aren't focusing on anything beyond that, clearly we are, but the core focus of the serious violence duty are particularly on these crime types as agreed uh, at a London wide level. So, as I mentioned, one of the key requirements is for us to carry out a, uh, a detailed piece of analysis uh, on serious violence across Harringay to understand what's happening within the borough and therefore make sure that we're in the best possible place to then respond to that. Uh, and for those of you who, who have been following this for a while now, um, I'll, I'll thank you, first of all, for all of the contributions towards the, the analysis that we have actually now got in place. There was lots of data, lots of information provided by a whole range of partners, which has enabled us to get to this point where we actually have some key findings uh, as shown on screen here. Um, so there's two pages of key findings. I'll just very briefly flick through a few of those just to bring everybody up to speed with what those currently are. So in the medium and short term, the overall volume of violence in Harrogate has actually remained relatively stable. Um, and we're actually now ranked around mid table in London for the number of non-domestic violence that we actually see. However, for domestic violence, Harrogate does rank slightly above the London average, um, although quite marginally. Uh, in terms of sexual offending, Harangay does, rate, does rank slightly above the London average, around about 11% above the London average, although clearly there are some elements of potentially uh, reporting levels as well as offence levels that might need to be considered. For example, with domestic offences and with sexual offences, we'd want to encourage victims to obviously report offences, but we clearly wouldn't want to see more offences actually taking place. So there is a bit of a balance in terms of understanding what that actually means. When we look at some of our more serious aspects to violence, however, there are um, some slightly more worrying trends. So, for example, serious youth violence in the borough, we have seen around about a one third increase year on year. Knife crime and robbery both seeing almost 20 percent, so 18 percent for both those increases. So I guess the takeaway point here is whilst overall violence has generally remained relatively stable, the most serious elements within that in Harringay are seeing some quite worrying trends. And um, just uh, following on from that, um, in terms of the London wide landscape, Harangay does dis uh, contribute, unfortunately, unfortunately, a disproportionately large percentage of the total knife crimes, robberies and firearms related violence for the for the whole of the city. So, you know, we are only one, you know, one thirty two one you know, percent of the of, uh, of London, there's only the social London boroughs, we are one of those, but unfortunately we contribute around about 10 percent, in fact, of those types of violent crimes. There's also within Harringay a significant geographical correlation between violence and drug related disorder. I think it's no real surprise for those who have worked in, in Harringay or work within criminal justice, but we are particularly in Harringay um, experiencing some really close links between violence and drugs. And clearly there are some drivers there which uh, potentially if we impact upon, for example, drug offending, we are likely to have positive impacts upon violent crime. Also, perhaps not really a, a huge surprise for, for those who have been working in Harangay for a while, but violence is not distributed evenly and equally across the borough. We have significant concentrations in some pockets of the borough, and in particular, where we have higher levels of deprivation, we unfortunately also tend to get higher levels of violence taking place. Um, that's not just a Harangay um, issue, however, in most other London boroughs, particularly boroughs with similar demographics to Harangay, that's also something which is quite clearly seen. In terms of where offences take place, generally our key violence generators and attractors for street based violence include things like transport hubs, so our trains, tubes and bus stations, uh, as well as our parks and open spaces to an extent, although not as, as significantly perhaps as some other London boroughs. And finally, our busy high street locations. Those tend to be the key locations where we tend to see our street based violence takes pla take place. However, with regards to things like sexual offending and domestic abuse, these tend to take place more frequently within residential locations, res residential settings. So, for example, where we have our larger housing estates, uh, that tends to be where we see a higher concentration of our sexual offending and domestic abuse offences. 
Moving on just to look at the serious violence duty strategy. So clearly the idea is we understand and assess the, the levels of violence taking place uh, so we can understand some of the drivers perhaps. And then as a partnership, we then uh, ensure that we have a, a, a response in place which is fit and proper in order to have you know, the best possible chance of having a positive impact upon the violence picture that we are seeing. So as part of that, we are required to create a summary of our strategic approach. Um, and this also outlines things like gaps in provision. So then as a partnership, we can then reconsider where we have those gaps and what we can do further to build upon those. With regards to the delivery mechanism for the serious violence duty, um, it has been agreed previously at the Community Safety Partnership that along with the CSP here, the North Area Violence Reduction Group, the NARVARG meeting, which I know a number of colleagues on the call are actually also a part of, will be utilised as the key delivery mechanism for the serious violence duty. And additionally, we're currently in the process of uh, refreshing the existing uh, Violence and Vulnerability Reduction Action Plan, the VRAP, which is uh, an action plan uh, uh, jointly with the police and also the London Violence Reduction Unit. That's currently being refreshed and a new format for that is due um, in early 2024. And it has been agreed that that will be utilised as a delivery action plan for the serious violence duty. And we will be bringing that uh, back to the CSP regularly to report against progress. So the final slide here, um, just perhaps before I hand back to um, our chair, um, is just a request to ask that partners note the contents of the report and the key headline findings, and also that partners continue to support and uh, the delivery and finalisation of the serious violence duty for Haringey. Um, support so far has been greatly received and really appreciated. Um, and also, chair, there are three discussion points on screen here, which it would be perhaps helpful if you wouldn't mind um, just to seeing if we do have any uh, particular feedback on these particular discussion points on screen here. Um, do the headline findings, for example, reflect people's area of business? Um, what can people's area of business do to contribute further towards violence reduction? And also, what can the CSP do collectively to, to perhaps address violence in Harringay more effectively? Um, but yeah, that's the end of the slides there. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Sandeep. If you um, if you want, you can take them down because I do have those in front of me, but if not, it's helpful to leave them up on screen and you're happy to do so, then feel free to, no problem at all. And um, really helpful to have those discussion points in particular, I think discussion points two and three in terms of kind of actions and next steps. But we'll start with the first one in terms of do the headline findings reflect the experience of your area of business? Yes. Sadly, so res yes. resounding yes from all of us. So yeah. I don't know if we want to probably focus our attention then on number two and three um, so we can make best use of the time. So what can your area of business do to contribute towards violence reduction? So I could just ask for some um, hands there in, in terms of as a partnership and as a CSP, what can we do towards contributing towards violence reduction? I think it's a it's a really helpful question, but there's such a complexity in the layers of the answer um, to this question. Um, there is, I think, do we feel we're really well sighted on everything that's coming out of the North Area Violence Reduction Plan that we co-share with Enfield? Um, and would it be helpful to pull some of what we currently um, are contributing and then have a view uh, around the impact and the, what we feel we should be doing more of? So that's an interesting one and we don't tend some we do at the odd time Sandeep share some of the kind of summary contents from NAVRAG in this group but not all the time and not routinely is that right? Yeah yeah that's that's probably a fair summary of it yeah um, I think some of the some of the work from NAVRAG is, is quite specific and detailed but perhaps we could bring those headline findings to CSPs on a more regular basis that could be yeah that could be an action we're taking away I think. I also think we could probably actually I know we've just kind of reset a little while ago in terms of the kind of next year for NAVRAG, but actually use it as an opportunity to ask, um, you know, Marco in particular as the chair of that, I'd be really happy to kind of take that away as an action, what he feels kind of is going well and what could be going better, what the opportunities are. Um, and I, I definitely think that's a useful question, so I'm happy to take that away. Bev, does that kind of answer your question? I, I totally agree. It's a huge question. Where do we start with it? I think and I think it's it's a really helpful question and one that we must as a partnership grapple with um, some of our my thoughts for children's social care and I know that there is a partnership consultation that needs to happen is I'd like to do some work to analyse the referrals coming in at the front door that hit threshold for social work intervention and to match that against the Educare and VVE and really try, try and understand um, what's the concentration the pockets in our community 
community where um, the mapping exercise of children and where they live is generating the referrals into the system uh, and what the, the safeguard is to react to that. That will be triangulating across my chat. I'm fading. I'm sorry, Bev, I think we lost you there for a second. It broke. I'm going to turn my camera off. <laughs> it's really crackly, Bev. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Oh, I'm there we go. This, is this better now? I'll it's a bit better, yeah. I sorry, think I, was I just... think it broke for me at VBE and then it broke. Yeah, I think we would. Uh, I just wanted to make the point that I think that we really need to use this as an opportunity to analyse the data, particularly that the data coming through the MASH, um, and to look at the um, where the where in the borough the young people who are referred in that generate uh, referrals to the VVE from the MASH and to the edge of care. Um, and I'd like to come back with the findings of that and the narrative around that. So that, that will help shape what we want to contribute in a concentrated way outside of the violence reduction plans and what's happening elsewhere as the gaps that that identifies. I think I need some intelligence around this now. Thanks Bev, that makes perfect sense to me and Sandeep's nodding too, so um, Matthew. Yeah, similar to um, what Beverly was saying, I think <clears throat> what we've done in the past with Sandeep is actually share data and cross reference data because uh, the data is obviously that Sandeep gets is primarily on on um, adult victims um, and adults as such. But obviously we hold the data from a youth justice perspective from 10 to 18 year olds, 10 to 17 year olds, really. So I think there's something about that learning and overlaying that data to understand it better. Um, similarly, what we've done in Youth Justice is to map those children that have come through to the Youth Justice Service and understand where they reside in the borough, what are the pockets of concentration. So, and it's quite fascinating when you see where they actually reside and where they see, mm, and yeah, it's actually absolutely. in the areas of where is the highest deprivation of the mm. borough as well. And it really gives us an understanding around, well, where do we put our resources? How do we work differently to reach those children and families as well? And I think it's just about sharing that data as well and how we make sure that they overlap with some of these things. So that's certainly something that I'm happy to do and bring back to this um, partnership in the future around doing um, a little bit more of a deep dive in some of the kind of cohort in terms of where they live and where, where are, what are some of the main characteristics. One of the other actions that we are doing coming out from our last partnership board was um, we are going to be doing a top 20, um, a tw sorry, our top 20 uh, persistent offenders report. And what this is going to look at is the life journey of the child before they even came into the youth justice service. And then when they and then, you know, when they come in. I think what we want to be able to, it's, it's a big piece of work in terms of analysis, mm -hmm. but what we want to be able to do is actually get pieces of data from different partnerships like education. We have children's social care data anyway, but they'll be involved in that um, and health and bring it all together and really understand the needs of, 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 of the child, um, what are some of the key characteristics that are being brought out. And once we're completed that, we're hoping to complete that um, by the end of March. And um, we've just started a planning meeting as of next week. Um, and, and with the scoping and what we're hoping to do is really have that data um, analysis done and the report that the whole partnership can use to take back into their own policies and, and, and strategies and whatever they may use it for to um, have a helpful conversation about um, what are the key learnings from this and what do we need to do as a local authority slightly different. So we're doing that piece of work, we're literally just starting it, but just for the partnerships perspective, we we did this in 2017 as a as a pilot, we did this work already, which you know really gave us some really good findings and it really started to get the partnership to think differently about how we work with um, those children. And I think that this would really be a step on to what we did in 2017. And, you know, we're, we're going to be doing the um, similar um, um, kind of thing again. So um, just to make um, um, obviously Sandeep aware, but obviously this partnership aware that that's what we will be doing. And we could present that finding as well in terms of coming back here. Um, Matthew, could I just ask and come back at that and just ask, do you know, do you happen to know in 2017 if you kind of had access and use police data as well in terms of 
we, <laughs> we, we got police data, um, probably not as much as what we can get now, um, because we have obviously good links with um, police data at this moment in time, and we can get different sets of data. But obviously, if we feel that we need more or there's barriers, and then I'm happy to um, give you a nudge and um, give Marco a nudge yeah. to help with that, and I'll, I'll, I'll block that. Yeah, that would be good. And hopefully you won't have that issue. But I just think that is also really interesting. And I know Bev and I have had other conversations about kind of the different pockets of data and kind of what mm -hmm. they show. So thanks so much, Matthew. Um, and Sarah. Hi, so no prize surprises. I'm going to talk about the illegal drugs market and the impact that that has on <laughs> violence and how thrilled I am that we're getting Project ADA. Uh, into Haringey, uh, which is a concentration on drugs and drug markets and tackling it. And I think the CSP really owning the ADA project will be really, really good. Thanks, Sarah. And I, I was going to suggest that as a potentially something of interest, it just has come up in almost every presentation that we've done. I was going to suggest it to the groups to maybe something we want to consider for the next meeting, um, because I do think that it it seems to be the key to so much of it. And we talk about it all the time, don't we? Um, so thanks so much, Sarah. Um, I can't see in terms of order. I think it's Zena next. Um, actually, it sort of follows on a bit from what Sarah was saying. I don't know what Project ADA is, but I get the gist. It's really about the relationship between organised crime in this borough and the fact that you you said, Sandy, we've got 10% uh, share across London, which is very big considering so two boroughs, um, and it linked to serious violence. So I'm interested in that relationship between, I have to say, I've, in my ward, there's always hints dropped about organised crime. Nobody ever says anything, but it's always a hint. And so you draw your, you extrapolate from that, you draw a conclusion. Now, I don't know how much organised crime is going on, but from what Sarah just said, um, in reference to illegal drug markets, I suspect there's more than I'll ever know and you're ever going to tell. However, what I do want to know is, in all of this, does the borough get um, con um, a re uh, the amount of resource which reflects the disparity between here and other boroughs? So if we've got this very high incidence, are we getting more resources from the Metropolitan Police and MOPAC in order to look at that? And how are we looking at the relationship between this issue around say organised drug dealing, trafficking, whatever's going on, money law, I don't know, whatever's going on and serious violence. So forgive me if I'm um, making some value judgments which aren't correct, but I would like to know what we're do if we know this is going on, you know it's going on, um, how would the resources and the deployment of those relates to the serious violence duty. Uh, is that a bit long-winded or do you get the point, Rona? Totally get the point, Zina. <laughs> really, really valid question. In short, do our resources link to the amount of organised crime on the borough? No, they don't. It's a whole factor of different things. Are we as a borough totally comfortable with the amount of resources that we have? No. As an organisation, are we comfortable with the amount of resources that we have at the moment within certain teams like neighbourhood teams? No. The, there is an uplift coming in terms of neighbourhood policing that does touch into the, the um, serious and organised crime element um, and part of their work in particular is going to be really focused on the two clear hold build projects that are going to be on the borough so there's only six pilot sites across London um, I won't say pilot sites it's actually not a pilot it's we're implementing it across London but out of the six places we're implementing it across the whole of the capital Harringay having two pilot sites having two sites I need to stop saying pilot one is Finsbury Park Harringay Ward it's joint between Harringay Council Islington Council Hackney Council which I know you'll know about already Zena probably the other one is Northumberland Park we've chosen those specific areas because that that initiative that approach is a home office approach which is there to yes reduce serious violence but it mostly targets serious and organized crime so we're working not with local resources so not with local north area officers but with central specialist crime with teams that have specialist skills in dealing with organized crime and then our neighborhoods officers are really there in terms of information intelligence but also the local vulnerabilities so basically how they describe it is you kind of just have to 
um, plug the vulnerability gaps within a community to stop serious organised crime working, if that makes sense. So it's your businesses who are kind of, you know, doing things they shouldn't be doing. It's all of those things that I know we know. So that's really kind of the bit of work that we're, we're pushing forward. So we recognise as a borough that serious and organised crime is a significant issue for us and also that it's impacting our wider community, our wider violence levels and our local residents in terms of their feelings of safety and their actual safety. Therefore, we've kind of committed to being an early adopter of that. And I'm really grateful to the council for supporting that because it's not been done in London before. And I'm grateful for the leap of faith in kind of supporting us with that locally. So yes, absolutely. We will need more resources than even the neighbourhoods uplift coming forward will give us. But slowly but surely, I hope over the next few years, that investment in neighbourhoods will start to, to see and feel like something for residents. I will, however, caveat that with the challenges in terms of recruitment um, and recruiting the numbers that we need to fill those spaces. And I'm always realistic about that so you're not going to suddenly see a flood of officers it's not based on serious and organized crime it's based on a number of factors including call demand um, and as Sandeep said there we're not top of the tree in terms of serious violence and, and that would come into the equation too although I'm absolutely not saying we don't need resources and um, so that answers the question Zena and um, Chantelle can I come to you yeah, there's um, a significant amount of work that's uh, collaborative working that's being undertaken across the borough to tackle, try and address violence against women and girls. Um, and we have kind of ongoing campaigns throughout the work that are led by the council, like there's one tonight being led by the police. Um, and then we've got 16 days of action coming up in November, December. So I think, you know, they're, they're really good opportunities to raise awareness about how mm -hmm. important we think the issue is, um, prevention and early intervention, but also an opportunity to kind of signpost people to our service offer that we have, which is, you know, we have access to local Haringey services, regional ones and national ones. And over the next year, we're going to be recommissioning a number of our VORG services, but already we've put in specialist provision. So we have like specialist um, black, Asian, minority, ethnic, IDVAs, um, an LGBTQ plus IDVA and um, specialist provision for children and young people. And also in t terms of specifically around prevention and early intervention, we have a Protect Our Women's programme that goes out into schools and talks about healthy relationships um, and, you know, su supporting people around that and giving children an opportunity to discuss issues that are coming up. Um, and we're hoping to enhance the offer over over the next year. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot that we could be signposting to already that I think sometimes we're not doing enough of. Um, and I think we need to keep just repeating the messaging to to our residents that we have got these services that can support people. And I think just the other thing that we can do in terms of prevention as well is promote our digital mental health office because we know that actually there's a lot of children young people that aren't going to go to mental health services or they're not their thresh thresholds aren't going to be high enough um so we have digital mental health offers like Cooth and good thinking which we know have been working well in other parts of the country and in haringey um specifically for children that are harder to reach as well and those with chaotic lifestyles at home so i think we could be doing more to pr promote those as well so just wanted to mention those as some of the things thanks Chantan. i think that's really relevant um, and actually before you mentioned mental health i was going to equate your vlog suggestions to some of the work that we have done as a partnership in the mental health space really trying to to use some more of the community provisions and to, in order to decrease the use of kind of um sectioning by police so i'd be really happy if you want to send um anything through to me in terms of specific uh, provisions that you think are underutilized and um, kind of under socialized i'd be really happy to have a look at those and see what i could try to do internally particularly interested then when you mentioned the mental health health about the youth space and in terms of what what we could do so we have an, a a large number of new safer schools officers in Haringey in particular and yeah. so I posted quite a few new schools officers in at the beginning of the term uh, the new the new term in September um, and I'd, I'd be more than happy to kind of give them a bit of an update in terms of what is available for their professional knowledge and um, so we can absolutely speak offline if you want to email me I'll pop my email in the chat in a moment and I'd be really happy to take that up for you okay brilliant thank you thanks thank you uh Beth Thanks so much, Chantelle. It's really great to hear you articulate the work that's being done and, and what that, how that will have a direct 
impact on some of the people that suffer the worst and also on our strategy that's been developed here. And I can see the read across straight to what Matthew's youth um, a coordination piece of work in the Youth Justice team is going to be doing. But what I wanted to come in and say is that um, uh, as well, well it is that I think we're moving to this. These questions provoke a very strategic oversight and response. And I'm wondering if if our, our interest is around vulnerable families, the vulnerable people, children and adults, and, and wonder whether there's a more detailed conversation to map out what all the various activities and you hear there's lots of rich work going on in quarters but what how do we understand the impact of each of those activities and the relationship between those activities to the two pilot pro programs that are going to be launched uh, in Northumberland Park things the data tells me that I've got a number of vulnerable children in that area and if we're going to clear hold build I wonder how that's going to have an impact on them particularly when we're getting stories from our young people that it's easier to get to somebody that helps them with their anxieties at the end of the road it, with illegal substances than it is to get to their GPs and I just really want to understand how we're factoring that kind of impact uh, a consequence for children into the clear hold build. Thanks, Bev. I, I think that's a really relevant point. And I suppose the whole ethos of Clear Hold Build is that much broader view and that mapping exercise. So how the structure works, in essence, is us deciding um, as a partnership where we think those sites would best be placed. So that was yeah. a conversation that kind of you and, and myself had. Um, we decided on those two locations for various reasons, but I don't think anyone here would probably disagree with them. No, we Although, don't. you know, we could have chosen more. But um, within that, then, the first task is to really decide the boundaries. So we're not mm. using the ward boundary and I won't take over the meeting. I promise you with going into it. But I just think it's useful, as we've kind of mentioned it. We're not using the ward boundary. The ward boundary has obviously changed in Northumberland Park and it's created a big change because you've kind of lost the estate, lost the other side of the road. It, it's really changed, not the demographic of the ward, but it has changed the makeup and the feel of it. Yeah, so yeah. we've gone across both sides. So forgive my brain. I'll always get this wrong. It's Bruce Castle at the other side, isn't it? Someone correct. Good. Thank yes. God. So um, the we've essentially cut across and used a bit of the old ward, in essence, and, and picked out where we want it to be and decided that jointly. And then, in essence, tried to map out what the issues are in the area in terms of the symptoms. The next bit, really, with the the direct partnership is what we feel are the causes the bit after that which is a much broader kind of public thing after we've kind of as a partnership got our heads around it is actually what can we do what is in that space what can we actually do to try and deal with some of the causes so we've started a bit of community mapping already in terms of what is there in terms of private, in terms of public sector and in terms of charity and third sector within that area in terms of community groups and um, what is there available in that area, but also broader across the borough and wider. But we really need the community input into that. So it's a staged Completely. approach. The first one, the first like partnership kind of workshop is coming up on the 8th so forgive me you'll probably have received an email from me um this morning about that and um, most of you so that's the 8th at the engine room and um, just someone from your team just to represent to try to feed into that discussion that is a partnership one only and um, if anyone hasn't received an invite thinks it'd be useful please pop your name in the chat and I will absolutely send that over to you um the next stage after that, in essence, will be kind of a more public event. So we want to have that partnership conversation first. So I hope that's helpful. And Shanta, I hope you can see how that will kind of fit in. And, and Bev, I'm really keen exactly to do what you've just said in terms of trying to target and focus what some of the existing things we're already doing and how some of the other work, great work that's going on fits into that, rather than trying to do it, spread it kind of across the whole of the borough. So I think that would work really well as a start of the 10. Thank you. I, I think that really that's so helpful, um, Rona. Thanks for setting that out for us. Um, I, I can pick up some more detail details from you outside of this meeting. You know, if we get sure. a chance to talk tomorrow, but it would be yeah. it'd be good to to discuss that. I'm particularly aware that um, our um, our director of environment and and residents is is. You know, should it's involved and I'm glad to hear that you but involved we might want to just hold more discreet conversations around the impact on children in those two areas and and partner messages for children's as well 
Yeah, absolutely, Bev. And I'll I'll send it on to you now if it hadn't already gone. Um, and please feel free to circulate it as widely as you like um, in terms of in, in your network. More than happy for anyone to kind of contribute to that partnership discussion. It's just not open to kind of the, the smaller um, kind of community groups, et cetera, at the moment. No, I hear you. But happy yeah. to take the, the other conversations offline. Absolutely no problem at all. Um, and it, it's totally a partnership approach. So it's not just absolutely not that you, but it's just been involved. Like this is a partnership project. It's not a met clear whole build it's totally a partnership one and that's what's the conversations around Finsbury Park we've hit slightly earlier so um, I don't know if Joe's had to drop off but Joe is is kind of really up to speed on those so we're in really regular meetings in terms of strategic tactical and operational delivery meetings just because we've had to be a bit more organized with that one because you've got three different councils so we've really yeah, tried to nail yeah. the governance down for that one before we can then look at Northumberland Park which we're obviously doing now so um, we're getting there anyway which is good so thanks so much Bev um, any further questions of Sandeep from anyone no? OK, thank you so much, Sandeep. Um, really insightful as ever. And then is Jean on the line? I think we were going to cover off Haringey deal. Uh, hello. Hi. Yes, I am hi. on the line. Hi, hello, everybody. Um, and thank you very much for um, for having me today. Um, as Rona says, um, this is just a bit of an, of an update on, on the Haringey deal and a, a heads up about a conversation that we'd like to have with you as individual partners and collectively about, about a related piece of work um, on a borough vision. Um, so um, how, how much time do I have, Rona? Um, I have a, a small sort of set of slides. So we've got 25 minutes left of the meeting or just less than. So I reckon if we go for about 15 and we can leave a bit of time for AOB if possible, Jean. Great. OK, I can certainly do that. Um, are you able to see um, my slides now? Yeah, um, I'm just going to wait. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. OK, um, so. Um, Hopefully, um, I, I, I can only see Rona, so um, I would otherwise ask for a bit of a, a show of hands to see who who is already aware um, of, of the Haringey deal. I know that kind of colleagues within the kind of council will um, will be kind of very aware um, of what it is and where it came from. Um, but in this presentation, I just wanted to give you a bit of a kind of flavour um, of, of what it is and what it might mean for the conversations that we'd like to have you with a, uh, have with you as a partnership group. Um, so just as kind of broad context, um, the kind of the Haringey deal is a set of commitments that aims to reset the relationship between the council and our communities. Um, however, it's important to kind of flag that whilst whilst that kind of commitment is from us um, as an organisation to to our kind of communities, you, you'll see when I get to the detail of what those kind of commitments are that it obviously has. Um, uh, you know, I hope positive implications for how we would work kind of collaboratively with with partners. Um, and we recognize as well that um, that you will want to kind of understand kind of what we are saying to kind of residents about how we will work with them. So the deal was uh, launched last November. Um, and since then, um, the, the implementation work that we have been doing has primarily been kind of in internally focused. Um, but we're at a stage now where um, we are kind of firstly kind of wanting very much to kind of come out and have kind of conversations with residents, communities, partners um, about the deal and what, what it might mean for them. But also doing a bit of a reflection process um, on, um, on kind of what we've achieved so far and, and where we want to kind of go next in terms of developing this way of working. Um, and you know, when I talk about a kind of way of working, um, what you'll see is it's very much a sort of set of kind of how um, principles that are about the kind of the relationships um, that we have we have with residents and kind of communities, and, um, and and the way that we work with them. That said, there is an important relationship to a bit of a kind of um, a piece of work on the kind of the, the what, um, and um, I, I just want to bring your kind of attention to a kind of forthcoming kind of piece of work that will be about developing a borough vision. Um, that will be a kind of a partnership uh, strategy for the next kind of 10 years with a focus on kind of those issues that we um, as a set of partners want to, to, to mobilize um, around. And um, many of you will very shortly be receiving an invitation from um, Andy, our chief executive, to an early conversation where we want to hear from you what are the kind of concerns that we might want to reflect there. So as part of that process about kind of what we focus on for the next kind of 10 years and our aspirations for the borough, we'll also want to talk to you about the deal. So hopefully this is a helpful early opportunity to understand where it came from um, and what's in it. 
So in terms of kind of the coverage of the rest of the conversation, I'm just going to I'm going to do that. I'm going to just give you a bit of a sort of sense of, you know, wh where where these kind of commitments came from and why and what's in it. Um, and then a very brief flavor of what we've done so far. So um, the the Haringey deal um, is, you know, is, is very much a sort of set of commitments um, that um, that were made by our kind of our, our new our new administration, and they're rooted in a sense that um, there are a number of kind of messages that we've been hearing very strongly from Haringey's kind of communities about how how they think the kind of council can work with them more constructively, um, and um, and, and develop our kind of our, our relationship with them, and the types of issues that it seeks to respond to are. Um, are kind of firstly um, that that kind of residents don't always feel that they have as much influence as they would like um, on decisions about about the kind of local area and our services. Um, that we don't always seem to understand what matters most to them, uh, and uh, and that we don't always seem to be as open to listening um, as we should be as an organisation. There's also a bit of a kind of sense that in the past we've not kind of learned from our our mistakes, and that there are long-standing issues that we that we haven't um, that we haven't addressed and learnt from as quickly as they would like. And finally, that we sometimes get in the way. Um, that it's sometimes not about what we do do, but it's sometimes about kind of us, us us being in the way where kind of communities want to get on and do things for themselves. So the Haringey deal responds to that kind of context, um, and it um, it makes six um, six kind of commitments um, or um, or principles for a different way of working, um, if you like, um, and it's also grounded in into um, two basic kind of foundations. So I'll start with the kind of foundations. Um, the first is getting the basics right, and that's very much kind of about understanding that we're unlikely to change our relationship um, with residents and kind of communities if we aren't um, if we aren't delivering kind of services um, well, if we aren't responding to their basic needs, um, if if we aren't kind of delivering good kind of public service that is responsive to to our residents. Um, and many of you will be aware that that is a really significant organisational kind of focus um, at the moment that spans kind of. How we deliver and um, deliver kind of customer services through housing repairs, um, through you know, what our website kind of um, looks like and what it's like to kind of navigate. The second foundation is about kind of knowing our kind of communities and really kind of recognizing that you know one of the things that we saw in 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 COVID is that you know Haringey with very kind of mobile kind of um, communities and some kind of communities with less kind of um, uh, strong relationships with the kind of council and public organize um, and public authorities um, are sometimes kind of less less known um, to us. We don't have the relationships with them that we should to be able to respond positively to their needs and, and work with them. So there's a, a significant program of work that's about understanding kind of who our kind of communities are, whether that's national kind of communities, ethnic kind of communities, um, our disabled kind of community, or, or indeed about kind of communities of interest, um, and using kind of data intelligence to kind of to, to develop better service design um, and inform kind of decision making. We then have six kind of commitments um, that reflect the kind of the, the kind of the issues that I've already described. I won't read them through in detail, but very broadly, um, they they kind of focus on really kind of active listening um, to to our residents and to our kind of communities and an investment in relationships with them over time. There's a challenge to us not to to focus just on kind of deficits and 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 need in in, in kind of community and, and not to problematize our kind of communities, but instead to think about where we can work with kind of communities and build on what is already kind of strong and working well. So that's the second principle. The third principle and one that kind of um, internal kind of colleagues I think will 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 recognize as being a significant kind of focus is about kind of sharing power. Um, and in practice, kind of what that's reflected in is, is a really significant piece of work around um, resident participation and decision making, um, service design that centres kind of resident experience, um, and you know an appetite to do work um, that that really kind of involves kind of residents and communities in in discussions about long standing um, and difficult problems of which you know you've been talking about many in your agenda today. Um, there's a commitment as well to develop a kind of real kind of learning um, culture where we um, where we we think about our mistakes and we kind of reflect that in in service design where we're transparent about our um, our our mistakes um, and we show improvement. The fifth 
principle is about kind of creating space for good things to happen um and and that's about kind of giving kind of um uh getting out of the way or or kind of making space for kind of communities to to do things for themselves and to kind of take take control and then finally there's a really kind of strong emphasis in the deal on working harder to hear the voices that are too often overlooked you'll see there we deliberately don't talk about um hard to reach kind of communities or or, or hard to hear this is about recognizing that um that, that, that uh, there's a burden on or a um, a, a, a kind of more obligation on us um, to kind of to 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 work to build relationships with some of those kind of communities who may have less visibility, less voice, um, less pre, you know presence in our kind of communities. So I won't go into kind of a huge amount of deal uh, a, a d detail on this, but I suppose just to kind of note that um, you know thus far because you know this is a kind of organizational to, to, to some extent a kind of organizational kind of transformation um program we have been focusing quite a lot on kind of what we what we need to do um internally um a number of you um will have um have seen some of the, kind of the efforts we've made for example as part of um, the wood green voices um process and indeed i know that kind of partners in the room are really heavily involved in that including the kind of weeks of action that sought to respond to what residents were telling us about what was important to them we also have a new set of organizational values that align with the kind of the, the deal and the ways of working that we um, embrace there um and we're doing kind of quite detailed work with services to really embed deal principles in their individual kind of context. Um, again, um, there are some kind of key kind of deliverables. Um, I won't kind of go go into those um, in detail, but I think it's probably helpful just to kind of note a couple of those that will be of particular kind of interest to this to this group. Um, so we do have a new sort of set of kind of consultation and participation kind of guidance that really kind of captures what we regard as being good practice um, in this in this context. Um, and um, we've um, the, 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 the community set of safety um, uh, strategy con consultation um, is very much kind of informed by that kind of understanding of kind of, um, of 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 good practice, including the really strong emphasis that there have been there has been in reaching lesser heard groups and doing that really kind of proactive engagement and relationship building with um, with residents. So that's a really kind of great example of positive work. Um, also, just to kind of flag that we will be launching a new engagement kind of platform um, that will be be, you know, used for kind of council kind of consultations, engagement and participation um, activity, but it's also a way that kind of partners can kind of communicate um, and, and kind of engage with kind of residents on kind of critical issues. So that may be of may be of interest. So um, in, we've started to kind of implement the deal within the council um, because we kind of think that kind of the change needs to kind of start start with us really. Um, and um, and and you know that's about kind of focusing on kind of what's what's most important to residents getting the basics right but the deal fundamentally is also about our relationships um and we need to understand whether what we've said um needs to be kind of adapted or developed to reflect you know also what's important to to kind of partners you know and to and to residents and kind of communities we need to talk to them more about about the deal so the next phase of the deal um will be you know will be about kind of doing that um and as we kind of start to work differently incorporating feedback and learning into that into that way of working and so what I what I want to do to do as part of this kind of um, this update really is I suppose just bring your attention to to this as a really important agenda for the for the kind of the the, the council, and it's hard to kind of emphasise just how significant a, a change agenda is and 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 how big a commitment it, it is to, to to working differently. So keen to to kind of get that on your radar and get your initial feedback um, on it, but also to give you a chance to kind of do a bit of thinking about what it might mean for um, for you as organisations and for um, for us as a kind of partnership as we move into that borough vision process. So um, I um, I I'd really kind of love to hear any kind of comments or or, or questions, but um, we'll otherwise um, leave it up to you to to shape what we what we cover. Thanks so much, Jean. Um, really useful. And I think for me, definitely provided a bit more detail than I'd seen before. So really, really helpful. Um, I'd be really grateful. I don't think it's contained within the pack. Um, I don't know if that's just me. So um, Naz, I'm not sure if it's possible to circulate it to the group afterwards. Yeah, that can be done. I, I can do that. I'm happy to do that, sure. Thanks so much. That would be great. Um, really helpful. Um, I can't see any hands up. Any questions for Jean, please? Comments, ideas? opportunities uh, to support 
only that I think it's probably a natural progression to involve partners because most of our work or all of our work involves partners so it, it, there is without doubt going to be a knock-on effect um, and it's important that partners understand the Haringey deal and how it how will affect them so I think it's yes yeah, it's, it's a simple natural progression and we're still to some degree bedding it in I mean it's some of it is really what we should be doing anyway in terms of business as usual and how we engage with residents and how we you know we put them at the forefront and how we um, change our, our thought process but in order for it to be business as usual I think partners definitely need to be on the same page so that when we're having those conversations it's it's more organic and it's you know we're, we're, we're all singing from the same hymn sheet so yeah, yeah that's all I want to say just more of a point on an observation as opposed to a question yeah, thanks, Brian. And I think we're all jointly accountable, aren't we, for a lot of our business. So actually, what residents mm -hmm. will associate with, well, actually, we haven't had that. Harrogate Council promised that. Actually, that's probably, you know, going to come from us and our failures in terms of that. There's definitely a lot of room to, to improve, to say the least, in terms of that. And when I just look at kind of ward panels, there are some brilliant examples of how ward panels work really well and get local residents in, are involved, but it's it's patchy and inconsistent mm. at best, and it's definitely not far reaching. Definitely, if you ask most residents in any ward in Haringey, they wouldn't feel like, I don't think, that they have a voice in terms of local policing and operations in their area. And that's something that that will inevitably impact perceptions of the Haringey deal and that's definitely an ethos that we we absolutely would take on board too so um once I get the presentation Jean I'll give it a bit more thought um, and, and take it away with with you but um Gavin and, and Joe and have a think about how we can do that and in particular some of the areas that we've spoken about as a starting point um, Eleanor you have your hands up hi thanks Rona. um thanks um Jean for that um, I was just going to ask for, around the um, weeks of action um, that you mentioned um, and sort of making sure that we're um, doing those and, and making sure that voices from residents when they come to us that it's, it's being shared. Do you have um, any maybe tools or ways that we could improve how we do the weeks of action, um, how we feed back the information we get? So, I, you know, I've been down um, in South Tottenham today for two hours speaking to residents um how how do we use that um i've got a long list of things that residents have said to me and a lot of it right now as you say will come down to police um a lot of it you know is is for police and i guess is my role in week of action i've sort of taken on to say making sure that we are passing on that feedback but sometimes a lot of the time residents don't expect a response they don't expect anything to change because they feel that it's not going to um and I guess it, it's how do we implement the, the Haringey deal as you, you've sort of set it out, Jean, to sort of maybe support us in doing that with these weeks of action. Mm, um, mm. Because the big thing that come, comes to me is, oh, you're, you're doing these and what's the impact? And we want to make yeah. sure we have, we have that impact um, as well. Um, so making yeah. sure things are resolved, but also knowing our limitations, I guess, on what we can, what we can resolve, what we, we can say we can. Yeah, I don't know if that was a clear question or not. No, no, it's really, it's a really, really helpful point, Elliot. I, th I think, I mean, I, I, I should say, I, I wasn't enormously close to the kind of the the weeks, the weeks of action. But my my understanding is that certainly as part of the Wood Green Voice, and actually, I think there's kind of colleagues in the room who are probably closer than I was. But um, um, my understanding is that there was a kind of real concerted effort both to well I mean the whole point of them was to kind of to show kind of rapid response to the issues that had been raised to kind of create the space for um for conversations that weren't about those kind of immediate issues recognizing that that sometimes if you're not addressing the most important issue to somebody you're not going to get to the conversation about something that is longer term less immediate whatever um so I know, I know that there was a kind of really significant kind of um emphasis on 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 kind of showing action um kind of kind mm -hmm. of quickly in our response but i think um as an organization what, what we've also I think kind of been reflecting on is that there um, as we kind of go out and, and kind of invite residents to participate more we need to be really really careful that when we are doing that we are doing it in a really intentional way and that we can kind of link participation to impact so that we don't end up in a position where there is that sense of, sense of fatigue or cynicism about mm -hmm. the value of, of, of participating participating and I think I think that is a risk um, that 
um, that is attached to doing kind of more participation if we're not really, really focused in communicating kind of the impact of participation in, in, a, in a range of ways. You know, showing is great by the street by being cleaner um, or by more presence of kind of whatever, you know, staff kind of or, or police officer, whatever, you know, whatever is in our gift to, to, to do. But that, I think there's also something about reinforcing those messages through, you know, telling sort of residents kind of showing kind of the what you know wider impact of, of of their of their input so um i will um you know i think an action for me is maybe to kind of go away and kind of talk to kind of colleagues who've been closer to the kind of weeks of, of action and maybe see if we can kind of capture a bit of kind of reflection on learning about how you maximize the impact of that type of type of intervention um if that's if i've understood your kind of question Correctly. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was just to make sure that when we're we're out doing the week of action as members of community safety, it's often um, sort of environment and resident experience um, team that tends tends to go out. Not not only us though. Um, making sure that we're communicate. Is there any tips I guess around communicating with the way that we communicate with mm. residents? So someone might come to me, but I not might not know the answer. But making sure that. Um, we're doing it in a way that I guess you would suggest because I've I've got a log of all the issues that I'm I'm sort of making my way through um, mm -hmm. that we will um, hopefully resolve. But I, I think it's also about managing expectations because um, you know it, it, it's not not always always that easy. But um, yeah, thanks. That would, that would be great, Jean. Great. Thank you. I can't see any more hands up and I'm conscious of the time. So um, I think we'll leave it there and I'm sure Jean, people can contact you offline if not, but thank you so much. Um, and Naz, I'd be grateful if you could circulate it. So um, that was the last item on our agenda. Thank you. Um, so there's just a couple of things Naz I wanted to ask. And um, the first one is, do we have a date for the next meeting? So we do have a scheduled date. Um, we, we sort of, um, as you probably know, we we consult on the dates but the scheduled date is uh, the 20th of December yeah okay we, yeah, we, yeah. okay okay <laughs> if it's scheduled we can we can chat offline and see if there's significant yeah. issues for people but hopefully and um, if that's sent out then hopefully we've got a decent RSVP list for it. I know it's always tricky that's kind of why I asked just so I could give people the heads up to check their diaries and make sure that we can have attendance um the second thing I wanted to ask was, I don't think we've decided on a theme for the next meeting yet, have we? Um, I, that's a question for Joe, really. Um, is, I, I don't think I don't think we have. So my my second ask, if that's all right, Naz, was just if you don't mind, um, and feel free to check with Joe afterwards if that's okay. But just contacting everyone on the distribution list and just asking if anyone had any particular suggestions after today's meeting, um, or indeed just generally about any topic. I think it's come up as a really clear theme for me that drugs might be an, an area of interest for the next meeting for everyone. And um, but I'd just really like to welcome um every, anyone's contribution to that before we make a joint decision on it. And I'll obviously let the the two chairs know. Um, so, do, so you mean everyone for CSP? Is that it? If that's OK, if you just okay. email and just ask if anyone has any suggestions. Drugs has been suggested if anyone else has any other um, suggestions or themes for the next meeting and then we can decide on that quickly um, and get some papers together and um, from both sides. And I'll make sure there's some police papers in there too. I think we just need some time to do that. So it would be it would be great if we could ask people and then we can make a decision. OK, I'll do that when um, well, I'll send out the um, the presentation for the last item there and I'll, 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 I'll make the request there. Thanks so much, Naz. Was there any other business from anyone? Uh, now, can we get the presentation Matthew sent out? I did. A, I, I have emailed him. I don't know if, it, if that could be circulated as well or if it was already circulated. It, I was wrong. It is in the pack, actually. Oh, okay. um, it is there. It was just, okay. I think, under agenda item number nine. It looks the same because the colours are the same because he's gone very okay. snazzy with the branding. <laughs> um, it's the same colours as the plan, so I didn't see it no at problem. first. It is in the pack, Brian. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. I'll draw the meeting to a close. And um, thank you. And thanks, um, Aisha and Naz for uh, for assisting us. Appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you to Aisha. Take care, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. Bye bye. bye. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye bye.